first off, I just wanted to say welcome to everybody. And thank you so much for coming to this webinar. My name is Anna Kemp. I'm from Watershed Watch Salmon Society, and I'm speaking to you from the traditional territories of the Esquimalt and Songhees First Nations. So I'm going to be hosting this webinar today with support from my colleagues David Mills and Watershed Watch ED Aaron Hill. Um, before we get started, I want to just take a minute to say a few words about how we're going to run the webinar, and then and then we'll we'll get going. So we're going to start off with a short presentation by Greg Taylor, who's, who will give us an overview of what we know so far about this year's salmon returns, as well as making some predictions for the rest of the season. This presentation will be followed by a Q&A session with Greg Taylor, um, who will be joined by Skeena Wild Executive Director Greg Knox. So uh, as Greg's giving his presentation, if you have questions, type them in that questions box and we'll go through and call on people to unmic and ask their questions out loud. One thing, uh, because we have a limited time and quite a few people in the room, uh, I'm going to be really strict about the amount of time people can speak when asking a question. So, so please try to keep your question to 30 seconds or less. I won't rudely cut you off right away, but I will after after about you know 20 seconds more than that. And, and I do apologize in advance, but I'm really doing it with the goal of getting to as many questions as possible. We may not have time to answer all the questions, but we're going to do our very best. So just don't hesitate to type your questions in as we go. When we get to the Q&A, please make sure your microphone is muted if you have not been invited to speak. And uh, because fisheries can be a bit of a hot topic, I just wanted to say first that we really welcome alternative viewpoints. So feel free to ask difficult questions. I think both the Gregs appreciate that. However, we really want to keep this space respectful to everybody in the room. So just please keep that in mind. And now I would like to introduce Greg Taylor, fisheries advisor to both Watershed Watch and Skeena Wild. Greg has worked in the seafood industry for over 30 years and continues to have a management role in BC's largest known stock terminal fishery in Lake Babby. So go ahead, Greg, on mic, uh, turn on, it looks like your camera's on. And when you want me to turn on or like change a slide, just let me know and perhaps you could start with introducing yourself. Thank you. And uh, Anna, as Anna said, I've been in the uh, both the commercial fishing industry uh, since 1980, 40 years, I guess, not the 30. Um, and some years, I, some days I do feel that old. But the, I have been in the uh, commercial fishery and uh, from the days when uh, salmon were truly abundant on this coast. And uh, it saddens to me to see the changing baselines over time to where we are today. But uh, I spent uh, those years with the commercial fishing industry and then I ended up uh, uh, vice president of a major fishing company buying all their fish in Alaska and British Columbia. And in 2010, I made the change to start working with the uh, conservation uh, groups, uh, beginning with Skeena Wild and then Watershed Watch, and also working with uh, First Nations, particularly um, on the Skeena watershed. Um, in terms of, uh, because I know Anna wants to keep uh, this uh, this part short so people can ask questions and she also knows that I'm garrulous when it comes to salmon. I'll, I'll begin uh, my short talk on salmon predictions. It's something I've been doing for 30 years is providing a, a sort of a snapshot of where uh, we expect salmon to go first of my, uh, all of my fishermen and then uh, and for First Nations and uh, lately for the environmental organizations I, I, I work with. And uh, my record is so-so, and uh, so take that into account when listening to this. But in this year, it's uh, this year is a bit of an exciting year after some very, very uh, difficult years uh, for salmon. We're starting to see some indications of better returns, particularly for sockeye. And we probably can uh, pin this or suggest this might have something to do with our very cool and uh, wet uh, spring. Uh, we all know that uh, El Nino is, uh, is uh, fingered for, for this, but just as important is seawater temperatures uh, in the eastern Pacific. In the, slide below, in the slide on the screen, you can see in June 2019, that nice red blob uh, of uh, sea surface temperatures, which were uh, 
uh, and no, normally warm. This is not the blob. The blob happened years before. This is just um, where sea, sea surface temperatures were uh, subsequent from the blob all the way to 2019. Uh, by this February, however, you can see a dramatic change. And that dramatic change is, uh, see, appears to have benefited our, our sockeye returns because early indications is we're seeing some real strength from Bristol Bay, all Alaskan sockeye returns. Uh, looks like early indications for the Skeena are, are good, um, which is really nice after seeing uh, some quite a number of years of very uh, disappointing returns on the Skeena. So, but it's early days yet. In Barclay Sound, we're seeing some real strength in uh, sockeye. They've uh, uh, preseason forecasts were for about 400,000 sockeye to return. They've upgraded with that to about 800,000. Um, some real good fisheries are happening out there, um, particularly for Gilnet and First Nations. The fish are moving very fast in these good water temperatures and flows. So I understand recreational fishermen are having a bit of a challenge. Prices are strong for the fishermen out there. I understand it's 250 a pound uh, for the sockeye. So uh, a good season, particularly for the for the gillnet fishery. It's uh, we're also seeing real good returns in the Columbia River to mostly coming back to a soyas. Um, Fraser River. It's very early days yet. It's very difficult to predict. Uh, uh, it's a late timing run. It's a cycle. Uh, it's a dominant cycle return we're expecting to see a large return and i would expect we we probably will um however the uh the fraser is different from most other runs and that it's of course a lot of the small out migration happens through the salish sea uh fish farms are an issue other issues uh so fraser river is always a bit of a different thing to uh, uh to predict but with everything else uh, seem seem to be going well for sockeye, I would I would I would suggest we'd probably see a decent year of for sockeye returns on the on the Skeena River. However, just because we see some real benefits of this uh, uh, cooler than normal sea surface temperatures and may probably benefits for sockeye since since we're seeing them so the uh, returns being positive region wide East Pacific. Why? It doesn't need necessarily translate into all for all species. For instance, pinks uh, problematic um, up in Alaska. Uh, just not seeing the returns. Predict forecasts are poor, um, and uh, early test fisheries are confirming that. Uh, so that looks like a bit of a concern for for Alaska. However. It can be good news for, for British Columbia salmon stocks because and when Alaska has strong pink returns, of course, they're fishing hard on their pinks out in District 104 with high interceptions of Canadian stocks. So if those fisheries aren't there, uh, we could see, uh, hopefully, uh, even if the pink returns aren't great, we'll see them sliding by that uh, interception fishery in Alaska and maybe we'll get some some benefit and we certainly will need some uh, because it this doesn't look very good for pinks uh, right now. So yeah, any Alaskan interception being down is good news for us. Chums in the North Coast, uh, it's hard to say. Chums are really a hard one to predict. Um, seeing up Alaska sort of just average. Uh, no, it's early indications both in uh, Prince William Sound and and southeast so it's hard to say and those are all hatchery returns mostly so it's very difficult to say what we might expect for for uh, central coast chums and other places and that's that's going to be an issue going forward because they have been very depressed for for any number of years so the north and central coast chums way too early to even think about our fall chums but i have noticed over the years that uh, what you see with chums they also tend to have a region-wide response. If you don't see strong chums in the summer, it's unlikely to see them in the, in the fall. So, but that's at certainly early days yet. The, um, the, uh, the other thing is, I'm seeing evidence of a bit of early return this year. 
not a not uh, surprising considering the water temperatures. Uh, so we might get a little bit of early return, which makes everything look a bit better. Having said that, I've never seen an early bad return. So I expect the sockeye return probably be a bit early, but it, it'll be okay. Um, also seeing, you know, looking at recreational catches, that's some pretty good indications of uh, wild and, well, particularly hatchery coho. Um, and which is not, again, not surprising since uh, coal only spend one year at sea, so they probably benefit from these uh, improved uh, conditions. It's very early in the coal return, so it's hard to say anything with confidence, but it does look somewhat encouraging. Uh, moving on to Chinook, what's well, a bit of a mixed bag? Uh, Alaskan Chinook, wild Chinook populations are not doing very well. Um, Alaska being a much more responsible agency has shut down most of their uh, uh, wild uh, Chinook fisheries. Skeena Chinook are doing better than forecast, but still well, well short of average. Um, but they are doing better than forecast and better than 2021, which is encouraging. Mind you, at the same time, um, all fisheries have been shut down. Coastal fisheries have been shut down, recreational fisheries. So, um, yeah, it's it's certainly encouraging to see it, the the number of Chinook in the in the Skeena, and hopefully that bodes well for other northern Central Coast runs. The uh, unfortunately uh, we're not seeing the same benefit for a stream type Fraser Chinook, those ones that are key to southern resident killer whale survival. It's they are uh, they are is disastrous. I mean the from looking at Albion. Uh, Test fishery, it's uh, very poor. I know uh, Anna brought up a slide here on um, on um, the percent of uh, Chinook harvest for North Coast slides. So if, if uh, just looking at that slide she had brought up, this is North Coast. So the percentage of uh, Chinook on the North Coast caught in uh, Alaska differs by area. Across the, the top is Nass, Stina, and then um, the Great Bear Rainforest, you can see the percentage, the middle line is 50%, so 50% of the total catches um, is that middle line. So it gives you an idea of what the percentage of the, of the total catch of stock by area. That middle row is Bella, is Bella Coola, um, Hakai Pass, Rivers Inlet, uh, uh, going across the middle uh, panels. And the last panel, uh, the bottom panel is, is Oakino. And you can see very high uh, Alaskan interceptions there. The um, so, uh, but going back to the the um, uh, going back to the um, stream type uh, Fraser Chinook look very very poor, um, scarily poor actually. And uh, it's they um, they uh, are a real concern. If you go to the other slide on Big Bar. Um, uh, Anna, you'll see that the big bar, the slide on the left shows you where big bar is. Slide on the right, um, that little uh, horseshoe up, that real curve there, right in there, that narrow spot is where the slide actually is. This being that the late uh, spring we've had, um, we're probably going to see uh, very high water levels continuing into the end of July, 1st of August. That's the time when a lot of these really depressed um, uh, so, both sockeye, uh, Fraser, early Fraser sockeye and early Fraser Chinook are going to have to migrate through and it's going to be a very, very tough go for them. They've done an amazing work in improving Big Bar, but only to average returns, uh, average uh, what flows. Above average flows, fish are still having a very difficult time. So this is real double whammy for these very depressed uh, Fraser River early spring type uh, schnook and a, a real concern. Um, so uh, it's uh, yeah, early Stewart too. Early Stewart are just starting to see they have to migrate through. You also see as you get later in the season into the summer run sockeye, uh, hopefully flows will come down and we'll see the uh, fish escaping above Cornell uh, doing better than that. Um, in terms of other Chinook populations, to return to other Chinook populations, wild Chinook populations on the coast, 
it's a uh, yeah we don't really know uh, unfortunately we do not do a very good job uh, identifying or identifying the status of them it's a real concern of many First Nations and uh, that don't live in the Fraser that they don't have a real good understanding of uh, wild shell populations in their territories um, hatchery type probably will see reasonable returns to uh, Chinook hatcheries um, the difficulty with Chinook hatchery populations and those whole fisheries is, uh, are supported by the hatchery populations. Of course, is, uh, there's a real bycatch associated with them and trying to manage that bycatch is, is a continuing challenge. So if you go on to this other slide, Anna, about the, the one that's uh, uh, of the map of British Columbia. And uh, this, this map, all those red dots, that, all those red dots are Chinook that are caught in a recreational fishery around Campbell River area. So it, this is all from 2019. It's all done by, put, I put it together from genetic stock uh, in, information. It just shows you the, uh, what a mixed stock fishery actually looks like, it's a good visualization of a mixed stock fishery. So that um, fish that uh, are uh, caught in that upper uh, Georgia Strait area, are returning to areas from way down in the Columbia through up near uh, Mount Robson in the in the upper upper Fraser and including Old Kineo. So um, yeah, it's a it's an amazing uh, visualization of the impacts of a, of a, a mixed stock fishery and why identifying what the impacts are are so important. The um, now there, I guess the, the final one I'd like to speak to is uh, Tom is Steelhead. Thompson and Chilcotin Steelhead are uh, in are so far in, in the hole. It's very, they're really unchallenged. They're beyond the critical conservation zone. Um, they're going to be facing increased interception fisheries this year, which is, ne is not a good thing. Uh, it is uh, like, um, like uh, early time Chinook, they're faced with uh, fisheries from uh, midwater ground fisheries through uh, in the uh, off Vancouver Island to um, other fisheries like our well Chinook fish or those stream type Chinook are faced with uh, by um, by catch and rec recreational catch and release fisheries through I IEU uh, illegal and unmonitored fisheries in the Fraser and all sorts, it's just a gauntlet these fishery, these uh, species have to go through these very depressed ones. So it's a real challenge for both the early time uh, uh, Chinook and the steelhead. On the other hand, um, Skeena steelhead, uh, it, they come in off a very, very poor year. Didn't see much uh, return. Um, you know, their brood years weren't very good, so we're not anticipating the great year. On the other hand, we've already seen three in the tiny test fishery, so um, who knows? Uh, it'll, it'll be something to watch, although they will be faced with likely be uh, somewhat of a, and be caught in, as bycatch in the expected commercial um, fisheries on the Skeena. Finally, I guess the final question is what are we going to see in, in terms of fisheries? Well, we see Barkley Sound, it's already had a, a real fishery going on. Um, the minister, of course, in 2021 said a great many of BC's uh, commercial fishery would be closed for several years to help the rebuilding of salmon populations. Um, that hasn't happened uh, to any extent thus far. Um, there's closures to the, uh, the NAS uh, sockeye fishery and the Central Coast chum fishery this year, uh, last year in 2021. What to expect this year? No one knows. Uh, Expectation is probably going to be somewhat a status quo that uh, even though the minister committed to this, it's uncertain what managers are actually going to deliver. In fact, they certainly wouldn't, weren't giving in the meetings this year that uh, that uh, they're going to be following the, the minister's directive. Uh, so it'll be it'll be interesting to see. And believe it or not, we are at uh, July 8th and we still haven't got our fishing plan from signed off by the minister. So that's why. Uh, saying that we really don't know because we really don't. Here we got you know major fisheries going on already, and we still don't have a fishing plan.
Anyways, I probably went on too long, so hopefully this is helpful, and thank you, uh, Anna. That was great. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so now I'm going to, uh, well, I will stop sharing my screen in just a sec, and I'm going to invite Greg Knox to join us for the Q&A section of the session. So just go ahead uh, and pop your questions into the chat box. And before we start with the questions, Greg Knox, do you want to unmic and introduce yourself? Okay, there we go. Sorry, <laughs> I was having technical difficulties. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Greg Knox, and I'm the executive director of Scheme Wild Conservation Trust, uh, based out of Terrace. Um, and I've been in a, doing fisheries work for about 20 years. The first five or six of those, I was working as a fisheries technician with uh, Nishka Fisheries and some consultants. And in the last 15 years, I've been in the executive director role at Scheme Wild Conservation Trust. And so, with that work, I do a lot of salmon conser conservation work of all sorts, habitat and harvest, uh, climate change. And so uh, I've been on uh, involved in fish planning work, uh, uh, providing advice to DFO, et cetera, for, for over 15 years, uh, being on the northern panel of the Pacific Salmon Commission, dealing with Alaskan interception issues in that, inside that process for about 12 years. And uh, yeah, working on a variety of habitat issues. So uh, that's me in a nutshell, and just here to try to help answer questions, especially my you know knowledge is really more north, central coast, and uh, Alaskan issues. Thanks, Greg. So um, the first question, I'm gonna gonna read it to you. I'm not sure who wants to, which of you wants to tackle it. So here it goes. Um, there's an awful lot of commentary on fishing forums suggesting there are plenty of Chinook, particularly on the in, inside east coast of Vancouver Island, and that fisheries should be open now. However, your slide suggests that the inside sport fishery is catching Chinooks from endangered populations. What's your thoughts on openings and limits on the east coast of Vancouver Island? That is a, a very challenging uh, question. There is no doubt there's lots of Chinook on the inside of Vancouver Island. Uh, however, mo a great majority of them uh, are from our, at least for research up until 2021, of course we're still gathering data for 2022, uh, is Puget Sound, uh, our own hatchery uh, production, uh, and also a high proportion of juvenile uh, small Chinook. So, Yes, there is a uh, high level. So people out there, the fisheries are closed. A um, lot of catch and release uh, and being forced to catch and release and people are frustrated because there are all this fish. Unfortunately, um, at the same time, um, there is uh, still, as we pointed out, these early time uh, uh, Chinook have been migrating through from a March and they will continue to migrate through until the second or third week of uh, July. There is other uh, wild Chinook populations that are also depressed that are migrating through at the same time. So in an effort to protect those wild uh, Chinook at a time when there's overall abundance of particularly hatchery Chinook, um, fisheries being closed to protect them. So it is really a really challenging conservation uh, versus uh, uh, economics uh, uh, question. And it's a it's a value judgment of for society of what's more important the conservation of these depressed fish and the or the or the the fishery the the uh, commercial fish uh, commercial recreational fishery itself so it's a valid judgment and one that has to be done technically there is ways to uh move forward with uh, better monitoring uh of these fisheries than we do now using GSI and other techniques. Um, and it would require a much better monitoring of the recreational fish uh, fishery and identifying both the uh, catch and releasing 
and uh, through genetic stock idea of what proportions are being caught, where. The other key question is when you're going through all these fish and the catch and release fishery and trying to protect other weaker stocks, there's a high level of mortality associated with catch and release, and that's got to be identified. And there hasn't been near enough work on terms of long term of mortality associated with with the catch and release, although there's been lots of studies on it, and um, it, it hasn't been incorporated very well. So there's a lot of work to do. Um, and the Washington tribes and Washington state have pointed a way forward in terms of better monitoring uh, of the fishery. DFO uh, thus far has been reluctant to engage in it. Uh, it's, yeah, it's a, it's a challenging situation and the reality is, yes, there's lots of Chinook out there. There's also a real bycatch problem and from a conservation or, uh, orientation, it's, it's important to, uh, to preserve those um, depressed and at stressed um, wild Chinook populations. Okay, I have one question here from, um, it says the asker is Kostyuk, but I actually can't find you in the attendee list. I'm so sorry. Um, oh, I can, sorry. I wanna unmute you so you can ask your question. Bear with me here. Ah, there you are. Okay. So you're actually joined twice, but I'm there. I've unmuted you. Uh, Matthew, go ahead. Are you able to ask your question, Matthew? Pass yet? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and ask it for you. Sorry about that. I see you put a couple questions there. So if you can unmute, feel free to interrupt me. Hello, can you hear me now? Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm uh, sorry, it's just the mic wasn't selected. So um, yeah, I was just wondering about like the, because uh, like a year ago, the DFO released the PSSI or something, closing a whole bunch of all these commercial fisheries, including I think like Skeena Sockeye, Fraser Sockeye, every, basically every commercial fishery. And now, uh, given the returns this year, it looks like they're going to be fishing for them. And then my other question is, these sockeye commercial fisheries are also going to be taking place during a lot of runs that have been closed for Chinook for a long time. And it doesn't seem like there's any consideration for protecting these Chinook stocks when we have uh, sockeye commercial fisheries. Like, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, two excellent questions. Uh, the PSSI, yes, like I said in my talk, announced in 2021 with great fanfare by the minister of how they're going to close all these fisheries to rebuild. Uh, Skeena Sockeye was never one of the on the list, but many, many others, including Fraser Sockeye, were. Um, again, the, the, the DFO has not announced what they're going to do for 2022, but expectations are uh, as you're right, Matthew, that we're going to see largely business as usual, um, that uh, there will be harvesting going on and uh, commercial harvests will go on, be going on. And two reasons the minister said she's going to shut these fisheries down. One, one to rebuild the target species, but the second is to uh, protect and recover those uh, species caught as uh, bycatch. In other words, if it's sockeye, it's not the just the sockeye they're concerned about and different populations of sockeye, but um, but all the, like the coho, interior Fraser coho, or, or the Chinook, as you say, or other species of steelhead, that it may be impacted by them. And so, yes, uh, I, like you, are waiting to see what's gonna happen. In terms of the bycatch on, on Chinook, um, probably not going to have a huge impact on these early time Chinook. They tend to migrate and clear through the system into the Fraser. It will get sunk. Don't get me wrong. And uh, uh, I think if they really cared about these early time Chinook, they probably wouldn't be allowing any commercial fisheries until well into August. But that might happen anyways, just because of the Fraser River timing. Um, but uh, these fish, um, it's not the commercial fisheries I'm so quite so worried about these, uh, these Chinook 
but once the sockeye hit the river, we're going to be seeing a larger amount of food fisheries um, and food fishing pressure on, on them. So there's going to be lots of gillnets in the river. And, uh, and uh, so, yeah, there's going to be not only the commercial, but other fishing pressure on them. So it really, again, becomes a choice. I mean, if they, they can only withstand so much, who are we going to allocate that impact to? people with a constitutional right or to commercial fisheries. And again, it's a very difficult value choice, um, whether we really believe in the cons in conservation or, uh, or catching fish for money. So it's, it's a difficult discussion. Uh, can I have a follow up or? Sure. Ah. That's okay. Oh, sorry, Anna, I shouldn't have said, I shouldn't have said that, Matthew. <laughs> I'm not the boss. Uh. Um, well, there are other questions, but uh, if it's a, if it's a quick one, sure. Yeah, you just mentioned that, like, yeah, they won't be fishing during the spring, but there's also, I believe, like the summer five twos that migrate like well into the end of August, which is why the recreational commercially shut shut down until September, and uh, it seems like there would be lots of netting that would occur for the sockeye that would impact those five two fish. That's all. Well, just quickly, the 5 2 should, uh, if these should be clearing the system by early August. Greg, I, th I think you might have muted somehow, Greg Taylor. I don't know what happened. So, anyways, um, yeah, it's a, well, I just say, Matthew, it's a bell-shaped curve, so it, it certainly won't be hitting the peak of the of those five twos. But will it have an impact? Absolutely. It's like think of any other bell curve. Okay. Um, the next question is from Vicky Husband. I'm going to unmute you, Vicky, if you're able to, to unmute. And ask your question. Hi, Vicki. Are you able to unmute and ask your question? I can read it out if not, but we do love to hear from you. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and read it. If you are able to unmute, you can, you can interrupt. No, no problem at all. Um, Vicki's question is, uh, maybe this one's for you, Greg Knox. Can you please comment on the seriousness of the Alaskan interception of BC fish? Did you hear me, Greg? Oh, you're, you're muted. What is happening? Sorry, try that now. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah, you, you had me Sorry. muted. I couldn't unmute myself. Uh, the seriousness of the Alaskan interception issues on BC salmon. So thanks, Vicki. Yeah, uh, well, I would say, you know, in recent years, they've been very serious. So uh, Alaskan interception has been kind of managed through the Ala through the Pacific Salmon Treaty since 1986, 85-86, and uh, in kind of the recent, it's always been a problem over over the years, especially for northern stocks like the Nass and Skeena, but also for stocks that are heading further south. You saw some of Greg's numbers. You know some of those. Central Coast and East Coast Vancouver Island Chinook stocks are getting uh, hit at, at pretty high harvest levels, and um, so it's it's a it's a big big issue for our fish. We know, for example, for sockeye, they get taken in large numbers. For Skeena and Ass, uh, Fraser can get taken in significant numbers. Chinook definitely. 97% of the Chinook caught in Southeast Alaskan fisheries are headed to BC, Washington, and Oregon. About 80% of the sockeye caught in Southeast Alaska are headed to Canadian river systems. Uh, for pink and chum, we really don't know. We, we don't have almost no information. There are a few tagging studies done back in the early 80s that looked at uh, uh, pink salmon. And so we can make some if inferences, but uh, it could be in the millions. Last year, for example, Alaska harvested about 48 million pink salmon. 
And we don't know how many of those would have been headed back to the Canadian systems. And they harvest about uh, seven, eight million chum salmon. And, you know, even if it's only a frat small portion of those, a few hundred or thousand, uh, that would make a big difference in river systems that are now starved of chum on the north and central coast. Uh, so it's a big issue. And I would argue for a lot of our populations in BC, it's now, they're, they're now the largest impact on a lot of our, our salmon populations. Um, you know, it depends on the year and it depends on how aggressive their fisheries are. But in BC, we've, you know, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans have taken significant action to reduce harvest levels as we've seen this declining productivity in a lot of our salmon populations. Uh, so we there have been a lot of fisheries closed and reduced, which now leaves Alaska out there as a big interceptor of our fish and uh, in the past this wasn't as big of a deal because if Alaska took you know 10 20 30 percent of, of a population when they're abundant and healthy they can withstand that but a lot of our populations just can't withstand those high harvest levels anymore so it's it is a big issue and something uh, Watershed Watch and Skeena Wild are working very hard on to try to get uh, action by the department, by both within the Pacific Salmon Treaty, but outside the Pacific Salmon Treaty, because that process has really failed us. Uh, it's not working. We're not getting uh, Alaska to take action. Um, essentially, they're fishermen in the negotiations, their fishermen get out of their seats, walk out of the room, and the last compartment of fishing game shuts down the meetings, and that's the end of the negotiations. So they're uh, first in line and very aggressive. And just to follow up, uh, Amos just brought up uh, two maps, uh, just showing the migration routes of uh, Canadian salmon, these just showed uh, from tagging studies back in 80, thought this returning to the NAS and Skeena. But those say that migration routes uh, show the uh, where Alaskan fisheries are on the outer coast there, how they would, and in their inner coast, how they would impact uh, Canadian uh, bound sockeye and, and where they're caught. And if Anna would go to the next slide um, showing Alaska, there you go. Um, the interesting point is that yellow uh, circle there is what's called District 104. Uh, Southeast Alaska same fishery takes place in that whole area. There are no uh, Alaskan pink or chum stocks out in that yellow area. That is, uh, and there's about 30 boats of fish out there. They're licensed to fish on the inside too. With, uh, there's 200 boats of fish in the uh, in the whole area. 30 boats fish, 30, 35 boats fish in that yellow area. If we could just close that yellow area, if America would just close that yellow area, move those boats into the inside area, because they're not catching Alaskan fish anyways, and moving into the inside area, um, Alaska could continue catching all its own fish and not be catching ours. And what's particularly interesting with this is that area out there, that yellow area, if those were Alaskan fish, Alaskan constitution and the Alaskan management system would not allow a fishery out there because it's an interception fishery. They just don't have them. So it's, they only, it only exists because they're, it's focused on Canadian fish. So the, the short, short uh, important part of this is that if the governments wanted to, they could reduce uh, interception of Canadian fish by 70% and still Alaska could catch all its own fish. It's one of the few things in salmon where there's a re reasonably easy solution. And we don't find it very often in salmon management, but there it is in Alaska and it's a, it's a choice just the governments have not refused, have refused to take or, or change. Okay, I'd like to, um, so Keith Simpson, you've asked a bunch of really great questions, some of which have been answered, I think, but um, but there is um, a question that hasn't been covered yet. So I'm just gonna, I've unmuted you, or you can unmute yourself now um, and, and ask your question.
I'm sorry. I'm I'm curious about whether this uh, webinar software is a little too complicated for folks. But anyways, um, Keith, I'm I'm going to just read out. Uh, well, let's see. We've got a, quite a few questions here, but I'm going to read out one of them, and you can feel free to um, interrupt me if you figure out how to unmute or if you're able to unmute. Um, so. This is an interesting one. So is allowing retention of marked hatchery fish a good potential solution for mixed stock fishing? I would say um, in theoretically, it's one of those things that works, it seems to make sense in, in theory, but there's some key factors that have to be understood and have to be introduced uh, in a for it, in order for it to work effectively. And that is, you first got to identify what you're catching. So if there is mixed stock, if there is weaker stocks in your catch, you got to know what proportions you're catching and what the impact is. That requires some, not only what you're retaining, but what you're releasing. So that requires some GSI, genetic stock ID, of identifying what stocks are in the catch and what your potential impacts are. So that's, you gotta be able to do that for, for this to work. Second thing is you gotta know, is those fish you release, are they gonna make it to the spawning grounds? So you gotta identify, uh, do some work and identify that and include that in your, your management system. And three, you've got to understand whether the all your catch information, your release information, your compliance information, uh, your effort information is actually accurate. Because if you don't have accurate uh, monitoring and effective, accurate information, it's the, it's like the old thing we say about computers, it's garbage in, garbage out. So these are aspects that need to be in place before you can uh, say uh, you can have uh, uh, um, hatchery retention fishery so it's a it's a complicated it's quite it's it's we we know what's required it costs money uh, it can be done and it has been done in other jurisdictions it's just not available in Canada right now we do not have the capability to do that kind of monitoring we do not have the uh, capability to do, do the GSI even though it's it's done in all sorts of other fisheries. It's just not done in the recreational fishery. And we're not, we just don't have, have not um, uh, done the work that needs to be done. Now, it's not like there's no solutions. There is some really innovative ways to uh, gather the necessary information and do the necessary analysis. This is not an impossible situation that says, no, you can never have a fishery like that. But you've got to make the investments and make the changes uh, that make that work. And I'm not putting this all in the backs of the recreational guys. Um, uh, although many don't like the changes, many do, and many are willing to embrace it, but it requires also a willing partner in the Department of Fisheries and Oceans and, and the necessary funds to, to make it happen. So short answer to your question, uh, Keith, theoretically possible, impractical and uh, not and I would not recommend that it, uh, it be done until this necessary work is completed. Now interestingly uh, DFO has just released, released a discussion paper uh, on MSF, uh, Mark Selective Fisheries and Mass Marketing Fisheries with feedback required by September 30th. What comes out of that process, this process may lead uh, to um, addressing many of the issues I brought up and may lead to the kind of changes that are necessary to move forward with the fishery like you're talking about. And, and I'll just add to Greg, you know, one of the key issues you brought up was kind of the release mortality. Do those fish make it to the spawning grounds? And some recent studies that show that in some cases, you know, upwards of 30, 40 percent of release Chinook, for example, don't make it die before they reach the spawning ground. So, you know, releasing wild Chinook can have major impacts that need to be understood. Yeah, we've done um, some interesting work. It's Watershed Watch and uh, Skinner Wild and worked and uh, built up a model using uh, the best research. And 
there's ways to apply this on an uh, area by, I mean, uh, when I say this, I mean understanding uh, uh, release mortality, long-term release mortality on an area by area basis. Because there's in the literature, there's risk factors, identified risk factors. Well, we can have a discussion around the table with uh, Breck Fishers, First Nations, and others about what the potential risk factors in their areas are and address those and come up with reasonable estimates, not perfect, but reasonable estimates what, what those risk factors may be and include those in management plans. So that, we've done the modeling. Um, it, it just needs to be embraced. That's great, thanks. We've got quite a lot of questions, so I've just sorry. sort of- uh, Sorry, I'll be, I'll be less yeah, verbose let's... from now on, I'm sorry. I want to make sure um, you know, there's quite a lot of people waiting, so I want to make sure in the next, we've only got you know six or seven minutes left, so we want, want to try and get to as many as we can. Um, the next one was uh, Kim Fulton. I, let me see, uh, you're just self-muted, Kim, so you can unmute yourself and ask a question. Hi, can you hear me? Sure can. Good. Um, my question is, this is um, a peak year on the Adams River for sockeye, and I'm wondering what the predictions are, if you know of any. Yes. Um, I don't have, I can't remember the actual number offhand, but it is uh, the dominant year. We're expecting substantial return, and I'll get that information if if Anna's got your email on that, I'll get that exact number for you, what the forecast is. I anticipate to have a very strong return. And if you could go back a couple slides to the Fraser River slide. Um, one more. One more. There, oh, you had it. No, you keep on, there you are. No, you're on the ski <laughs> We're looking for the Fraser. Anyways, forget it. The um, the complication is on the on the uh, there it is on the sock, sockeye timing for the Fraser River is the uh, what they shows there is the red uh, is the lakes and it is the dominant as you say dominant is where all the fisheries is going to be concentrated. If you look at the my hand drawn dot diagram at the bottom. So the top of the diagram is what DFO says that's what the world looks like. The bottom diagram is actually just hand drawn is all those colors are wild salmon policy colors. Red being endangered um, and fishing shouldn't happen. Uh, amber being um, uh, cautious fishing and green being where it's abundant and you can have aggressive fishing. Um, but that's what the world looks like to a sockeye coming back. So managing to harvest that, those abundant lakes while protecting all those other stocks is going to be the challenge this year. Thanks. Uh, for the next question, Stan Turner, you've posed a couple interesting questions. I'd like to give you the chance to ask, to ask a question if you can unmute yourself and go ahead. Yeah, hi, can you hear me? You sure can, thanks. Okay, yeah, the first one was based on recreational fishing versus commercial fishing. Uh, I know from experience that when you go recreational fishing, it, it, it's worth about 50 to $100 to the economy, whereas commercial fishing is probably only worth 10 or $20 to the, to the economy. So why do the governments not sort of restrict commercial fishing when things go bad to keep the economy going because of the money that's in it in recreational fishing? Well, in essence, they have. <clears throat> Under the allocation policy, 95% um, of coho and chinook are allocated to the uh, recreational fishery, 5% allocated to the uh, net fishery. So in essence, back in, I forget when it was, 1999, uh, they made that decision. And so you actually see, in terms of chinook fisheries and coho fisheries, very, very limited uh, commercial fisheries on the south coast, and even on, uh, for Chinook on the north coast, uh, there's a lot more coho fisheries up there commercially. So yeah, that, that's effectively already being done. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what more the government could do in terms of the allocations. I think the challenges for the uh, recreational fishery are like the challenges for the commercial fishery uh, 20 years ago, is figuring out how to catch the 
abundant stocks while uh, reducing their impact on the less abundant and the endangered ones. And the second thing I had was, I was in Alaska and saw basically a fishing ranch where they, they trapped the salmon returning to spawn and they melt them and they raise them to fingerling size or bigger so they had a greater success rate go downstream. And then they let them back in the ocean, I think at that point, but we could take them back up to the regular spawning ground and release them. Would that not be a way of sort of helping nature get the salmon stocks back to where they, where they once were? So you're, talk, you're talking about ocean ranching and um, Alaska style ocean ranching. They, they have a huge, massive production in, in Alaska. And, and the species they use in ocean ranching are, are pink and chum salmon because they don't require a freshwater component. You can essentially release them right into the ocean. And it's much more cost effective to, to do that. And you can also release them further out on the coast away from river systems to reduce uh, kind of the mixed nature of the fisheries when they return. Uh, the, some of the challenges with that is uh, that you're, you know, there's more pink and chum salmon in the ocean than there's ever been. And with warmer ocean temperatures in, in many recent years, we, we have less food available. Uh, you know, warmer ocean means uh, smaller species of zooplankton with less fat content. They're kind of the basis of the food chain for, for salmon and the fish salmon eat. And uh, when you pump out uh, literally billions of these pink and chum salmon, you're, you're adding competition into the ocean for wild fish and for species like sockeye and chinook and coho and steelhead. And uh, so, uh, you know, five, over five billion salmon are being pumped into the ocean from hatcheries now, currently, and about 40% of the salmon going into the ocean are from uh, hatcheries and mostly ocean ranching facilities. So there's all sorts of other issues related to hatcheries, which I won't get into because that's a whole subject on it in itself. But um, yeah, those are some of the considerations. Uh, when looking kind of for that uh, those that hatchery fix to just substantially boost up production again, essentially in a, in, in a way you're just replacing wild fish with hatchery fish. Well, are they not are they not wild fish when you basically would would, would hatch raise them up and then release them where their regular spawning ground is, so they have to migrate back down in in the in, well, when they raise them in a hatchery environment, they typically don't release them until they're ready to smolt to go to sea. And uh, they raise them in artificial environments. So in simple terms, in, in the wild, only the strong survive because they're hatching out of the gravel and into the wild river system or lakes, and they have to fight for their lives in that environment. In hatcheries, most survive. So you're really, um, you're not ensuring that only the strongest genetics are being passed on to the next generation. So um, we are running out of time. And so we've got just one last question. Um, uh, there are a number of questions that we haven't gotten to. So I'll be having a look at those and figuring out how to get some answers to, to you all after the fact. Um, but a couple of people, including Bob Hooten and Neville Gosling, have uh, asked questions about the impact of in-river gill netting. I'm wondering, you know, this question comes up a lot. I'm wondering if you could speak to this issue. Uh, I'm happy to start, and Greg, you can sure. add. Yeah, it's, you know, as we cut back, um, you know, commercial fisheries, especially recreational fisheries to a certain degree, um, you know, in-river food fisheries are becoming a much larger port, you know, dominant, much more dominant part of the catch uh, of the harvest in, in, in river systems. And the challenge with, with these gillnet fisheries, uh, food fisheries, is that they're unselective. So they catch all five species of salmon and steelhead. And so if you put a gillnet into a river system like the Skeena, uh, you're catching everything, and you're, you're you know, you're out there. First Nations are either taking it for food, 
or they're releasing, potentially releasing some of the species they don't want. But if you have, you know, Chinook populations or steelhead populations or other species in the future that really are in the tank, you know, like we saw for Skeena steelhead last year, for example, and Skeena Chinook in recent years, uh, then, uh, you know, you really, the, the, the answer in all fisheries is increasing selectivity. And so gillnets just don't work very well anymore in the current environment we're in, because on any given year, any species or, or subpopulations within a river system can collapse. And if we want to protect and rebuild those different populations, we can't do it if we're not if we don't have selective fishing gears. Uh, and and so, it, you know, whether it's gillnets in the river or out in the ocean or some of the other types of gear, you know, it's selectivity is really becoming much more important. And there are a lot of solutions around this. A lot of First Nations are moving and have moved to more selective uh, gear types, but we need a lot more of that. We need to really uh, step up uh, and encourage that, but provide resources to transition away from uh, gear types like gillnets. I couldn't agree with Greg more. Uh, he's he's absolutely correct in terms of uh, fishery issues, like harvest issues right now. Uh, it's probably the largest uh, harvester, unselective harvester of uh, fish uh, on some of the major, and we're talking the major river systems. We're talking Fraser, Skeena, uh, primarily. Um, two things that uh, you can, uh, you as the public can do. Next time you see someone selling a, a sockeye off the side of a truck, don't buy it. Only be buying legal fish because there is a, not only the fisheries for food and uh, somewhat controlled, but there's also a high level of IUU fisheries, which is illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing going on on the major river systems. And uh, that fish is being sold and people are buying it. If people didn't buy it, it wouldn't be happening. Okay, um, just before we wrap up, sorry to be a bit abrupt there, but before we wrap up, I want to just invite Watershed Watch ED Aaron Hill to say a few words. Thanks, Anna. Thanks for organizing this and moderating it. Thanks to the Gregs for your 